Hello, everybody. We are in a new series here at CCK, thinking about the wonder of the Reformation. Did you know that the year 2017 is uh, 500 years since the Reformation got kicked off by Martin Luther by pinning up those 95 theses on the church door in Wittenberg? And we're going to be thinking about uh, the way that we can have a Reformation in our hearts, not just to appreciate the Reformation in history, but to have a Reformation in our hearts. And we're going to do that by thinking about five aspects of the Reformation, beginning uh, today with Scripture. As people have reflected back on the teaching of the Reformation, people have thought, you know what? The Scriptures have given birth to this liberating power that has actually overturned the world. And today we're going to think about how the Scriptures can cause that kind of Reformation, not just in history, but in our hearts. Can I pray for us as we begin? Let's pray. Our dear Father, we want to hear from you your clear, living, and active words. May we hear you speaking to us through your Scriptures that you might bring liberation, that you might bring reformation for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. My name is Glenn Scrivener, and I was a medieval teenager. Let me tell you about being a medieval teenager. I was a seriously religious kid growing up. I went to church, went to kids' clubs and Bible studies and youth group. I remember when I was about nine or ten years old being in church, and uh, I'd been yawning a lot, and I'd been welling up, therefore. And with a tear in my eye, I looked across the, the, the aisle, and there was a woman there, and I had no idea really what she was thinking as she looked at this young little you know, ten-year-old boy welling up during worship. But I chose to believe that she was really impressed by my tender-hearted worship. And from that moment onwards, I decided to try to cry in worship every single Sunday. It was really important to me that I looked like I really meant it. And uh, so that was, that was the effect that I went for Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Uh, the, the real chink in my armor, I didn't really think through this plan because basically the way I tried to cry every week was by yawning a lot. Um, so I'm sure I didn't really look like I was intensely into the worship. I was just this kid who was yawning. and What am I, bored by church every week? But I was always trying to yawn, always trying to well up because it was really important that I meant it and that people saw that I meant it. I never even questioned the fact that I was faking it Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. It needed to be real, so I made it real. That's the kind of teenager that I became. When I was 13, I remember go going away to a, a, a conference, and there was a, a preacher there who uh, told us all to get on fire for Jesus. And I remember thinking, yeah, I am on board with that. I am a medieval teenager. I am absolutely religious to my core. Of course I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. And it seemed a little funny that this preacher wanted me to say these particular words in that order at that time. Because I told Jesus I wanted him to be Lord hundreds of times. But, but I prayed the prayer at the conference. And nothing. I felt absolutely nothing. It's funny because I, I went home to the, I went back to sort of the cabin where, where I was sleeping at, at this sort of big kind of campsite. I remember going into the bathroom and switching on the light and trying to see, like, was there a, I don't know, a light behind my eyes? Was there an ethereal glow? Was there a halo above my head? Had it worked? It didn't work. And so I prayed again. This time I really meant it. This time I really said the words and I, and I made sure to say them exactly the way that the preacher told me to say them. And nothing. So I thought, okay, I'm going to have to bring out the big guns. And uh, the next day, I, uh, I went out into uh, where we were at this big campsite, and there was a river with a, a bunch of rocks, and in the middle there was this large kind of island, this rock island in the middle. And I remember kind of hopping across the rocks and standing on, on this like, big kind of island in the middle of the river and lifting my hands to the heavens. And I, I probably wished that there was a photographer there because I imagined that this is the sort of image you would find in Google image searches if you just looked up devoted or, you know, passion or something. And there's me. And I'm praying, God, take me, use me, fill me, guide me, your will be done. Nothing. So I prayed again and again and again. I made it my daily ritual 
to give my life to God. And I remember during my teenage years, uh, a passage from the Bible that absolutely haunted me was from the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, Do you know the story when Jesus, the night before he dies, he goes into this garden, this wooded place, scary place, in the middle of the night, and he like prays this ultimate prayer of dedication before God. And he finishes off by saying, your will be done. And I remember thinking to myself, that is just the ultimate prayer of commitment. I need to copy it. And every day, I would pray this prayer of commitment. It got to the point where I would volunteer to walk the dog because we had like this forest area near where I lived and I could take the dog to this wooded place at night when it was scary. And by moonlight, I would press my face literally into the dirt and say, God, take me, use me, fill me, guide me. Your will be done. And nothing. So I did it again and again and again. How do you think I started to feel about God at this stage? Actually, I hated him. Here was I giving myself to God the whole time, and he didn't seem to be wanting what was on offer. There I was, knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door, and if if he was at home, he was hiding behind the sofa, hoping I'd go away. So I did. When I became 18, left home, I left my faith behind me. I was burnt out as a medieval teenager. What did I need? I needed a reformation. I needed the scriptures to come into my life and absolutely liberate me, absolutely turn me right side up. And what I want us all to have is a feeling of reformation. I don't know if you've had a history like that. I don't know how many times you prayed a prayer of commitment. I won't get you to raise your hands for you know, more than 10, more than 100. <laughs> I reckon probably a 1,000 times me. I, might, I, I don't know if I'd win in this room. Maybe you've, maybe you've prayed even more than a 1,000 times, giving your life to God in ever more melodramatic ways. Uh, you need a reformation. I needed a reformation. Our culture needs another reformation. In all our hearts, we need a reformation. Let me tell you what the reformation was and how it came to be. And as I tell the story of the Reformation, maybe you'll start to see there are some links between the Reformation and my story, and maybe you'll start to see there are some links between the Reformation and your story. So back in the, in the 16th century, if you were in the 16th century, uh, it was a lot like growing up in a Christian home. I don't know if you grew up in a Christian home, but you kind of grew up in this Christian environment. If you grew up in the 16th century, you grew up in a Christian culture. That was kind of the law. You went to church. That was the law. You submitted by default to what the church taught. Uh, Mostly, you couldn't understand what they taught, because if you went to church on a Sunday, they would speak in Latin. Uh, You might know, we've got the bread and wine here. Uh, You might know in the medieval church, they'd call that the mass, when you had the mass. And uh, the priests would uh, pick up the bread, and they would say in Latin, this is my body. Um, but of course, in Latin, that's hoc est corpus meum, as I'm sure you all know. Hoc est corpus meum, they would say in Latin. And for all the riffraff at the back who don't speak Latin, you know what that sounds like? Hoc est corpus meum. Sounds like hocus pocus, doesn't it? That's where we get, that's where we get the, the, the name from. Hocus pocus is literally what the people of the 16th century were hearing as the priests were doing their magic. It just seemed like magic. Hocus pocus. All this stuff that they were doing in Latin, and the people had no idea what was going on. Well, the preacher would sweep up into the pulpit on a Sunday and they would give the message. And the message was basically this. You are a dreadful sinner under God's judgment. But don't worry. God has given us the church. And within the church, we've devised a system. And the system is going to help you jump through the hoops and make your way to heaven through rituals and prayers and confessions and pilgrimages and good deeds and so on. These special activities can pay off your sin and earn your way with God. I mean, you probably won't pay off all your sins in this life, but don't worry. After death, the system continues. Isn't that good news? And afterwards, don't look for this in the Bible, it's not there, but afterwards, the the church taught, there's this thing called purgatory, where if you've still got some remaining sins, you can burn them off for an extra thousand, maybe million years. And then, maybe, you'd make it to heaven, unless you've committed a mortal sin in which it's straight to hell for you. 
That was the essential message. Uh, but it was usually packaged in, in a really fluffy, warm kind of way. One of the things that preachers would always say is, listen, God will not deny grace to those who do their best. It's kind of the old version of God helps those who help themselves. God will not deny grace to those who do their best. But here's the, here's the point. How do you know you're doing your best? You know, when I was a teenager praying those prayers, how did I know I really meant it? How did I know I was doing my best? And doesn't it kind of assume that all of us are really, really trying and we just need a few extra divine caffeine shots to get us over the line? Is, is, that, is that the way it is with salvation? Well, Sunday by Sunday, if you were growing up in the 16th century, this is the message that you were hearing. Be more like Jesus. Do more for God. Climb the ladder. And it should be obvious that none of this has anything to do with the Bible. Because if you open up the Bible and read more than two pages, it's going to contradict this ridiculous man-made system. But we're talking about a time when the, the printing press had just been invented. It was invented in the 1440s, and nobody had Bibles at home. Those who uh, did have Bibles, they would have to have them in Latin. I don't know if you know this, but uh, in England, it was against the law to own a Bible in English. In 1519, there were seven parents who were burnt at the stake for the crime of teaching their children the Lord's Prayer in English. That was too much. You can't, you can't even teach the Lord's Prayer in English. You're burnt at the stake. And so the Scriptures are this distant thing written in mumbo-jumbo. It's literally hocus-pocus to you. Only the official teachers of the church, apparently, could understand such a difficult book. And so really, according to the officials, it was best if ordinary Christians just shut up, let the church engage in the tricky task of understanding the Scriptures, and everyone just got their heads down and worked away at the system. But that all changed with a monk called Martin Luther. Uh, Martin Luther was born in 1483, and uh, he was a man who was buried deep in the system. In 1505, he had a promising career ahead of him as a lawyer. Uh, but on the 2nd of July, 1505, he was caught in a violent storm, and he was in fear of his life. And so he prayed, help me, I will become a monk. He survived the storm, and he was true to his word. And so he threw one last great party with his friends, and two weeks after he made this vow, he entered into the monastery. In the monastery, uh, things got very serious. Each day would contain eight different prayer times. One of them was at 3 a.m. Uh, Luther did all sorts of pilgrimages. Uh, he spoke about in 1510, he went on a pilgrimage to Rome, and he joined in with all the crowds, uh, seeing all the holy relics. And uh, one of the things he did was go to the Scala Sancta, the holy stairs, the Scala Sancta. And apparently, according to mythology, the Scala Sancta was actually the staircase that led up to Pontius Pilate's uh, palace in Jerusalem. And somehow they had gotten that staircase to Rome. And people could visit Rome, the very staircase on which Jesus Christ had stood when he was tried the, 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 the morning of his death. And so the pilgrims, they would go to the Scala Sancta, and I think it's a really great picture of what the medieval church was teaching. You had to climb up the Scala Sancta, preferably on your knees, kissing each step, saying the Lord's Prayer in Latin, obviously, on the, each step, on the way up. And if you got to the top and you did it all right, you'd have your sins forgiven. Maybe. And Luther went to the Scala Sancta, and he went on his knees, because he was, he, was, he was a serious dude, going up the steps, kissing every step, saying the Lord's Prayer. And when he got to the top, he said to himself, who knows whether this is true? And I don't know if you've done that in your spiritual life. Have you ever gone through a whole bunch of religious practices and you've got to the top of them and you've thought, did it work? Who knows? Or maybe you've just climbed to the top of your career and you've got to the top and you've thought, who knows? Maybe you've achieved that personal goal that you were after for so many years, and you've got to the top and you thought, who knows? Well, that was Luther, absolutely stuck in the system. But the upside of Luther's monastic life was that he had a lot of Bible time, and he could 
open it and, and read it, and he understood the Latin. And he was becoming not just a student of the Bible, he also became a teacher of the Bible. In 1512, he became Doctor of Bible at the University of Wittenberg. And this is where the revolution came. As he was exposed to the Scriptures, so the Reformation broke out in his heart and in all Europe. He was studying Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Do you want to turn to it? Romans, 17, Romans chapter 1, verse 17. We'll have it on the screen as well if, if you uh, haven't got one in your hands. Luther was lecturing on the book of Romans, and there was a verse that got under his skin. That's a really good thing, if a verse from the Bible gets under your skin. It's a really good thing. But Luther, he didn't like it. But here's the verse. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And the thing that really got under his skin is that idea of the righteousness of God being revealed. He didn't like that. To him, it sounded like God had a standard. That's his righteousness, right? Surely that's what God's righteousness means, right? There's this standard, this bar that you've got to get over. There's the top step of the Scala Sancta, and you've got to get up to the top. There's the righteousness of God is revealed. And he could only read this verse as being God setting you a target that will crush you. And then he wrote this on the next slide. Here's how he described the reformation that Scripture brought. He says, though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt that I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. I could not believe that God was placated by my satisfaction. I did not love, yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. And secretly, if not blasphemously, contained, certainly murmuring greatly, I was angry with God. I raged with a fierce and troubled conscience. And then he beats impatiently on Romans chapter 1 trying to figure out what it means. As the quote goes on, Nevertheless, I beat impatiently upon Paul. Paul writes Romans chapter 1. Beat impatiently on Paul. Don't you love that phrase? Beat impatiently on Paul. Most ardently desiring to know what he wanted. At last, by the mercy of God, meditating day and night, I gave heed to the context of the words. This is great. He does Bible study, and it really bugs him. So what does he do? Deeper Bible study. And it liberates him. What does he do? He, he looks at the context of the words. Actually, what he looks at is Habakkuk. If you were here for our Habakkuk series, you, you'll know that the righteous shall live by faith is a verse straight out of Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk saved Luther's life. Habakkuk saved the church. The righteous shall live by faith was the context. And then he realized, you know, when God sets his righteousness, it's not a standard that is above us. It's a gift that is given to us to, to be received by faith. And suddenly Luther starts to see, you know, God giving us his righteousness is not him giving you a standard to crush you. It's him giving you a gift to liberate you. And so he goes on. Uh, Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. Through Bible study, the wonder of the gospel absolutely grips his heart and brings transformation not only to Luther, but also to the church. Here is the message of the Bible. The message of the Bible is, is not God's got a standard of goodness. Come on, have a go. See if you're hard enough. Come on, see if you can do it. The message of the gospel is, the message of the gospel is, here is Jesus. He is God's righteousness, and he's a gift given to you. Will you receive him by faith? You see, the message of the Bible is not climb the stair, climb the stair, climb the stair, climb the stair, and who knows? The message of the gospel is God meets you in the pit. Every religion in the world tells you, maybe get to the top of the stairs and we'll see. The message of the gospel is Jesus meets you in the gutter. And when Luther got that, when he got the scriptures, when he meditated on them day and night and he understood the context of them, it birthed a reformation in his heart. It birthed a, refor a reformation in the West. Well, Luther starts shooting his mouth off about this, wouldn't you? 
If you suddenly get liberated by this truth, you've been climbing the stairs, climbing the stairs, climbing the stairs, and you suddenly realize you were loved down there at your worst. Wouldn't you suddenly shoot your mouth off? That's what Luther does. And he just starts writing all this stuff, and it goes absolutely viral. Yeah, you might have heard about the, the, the 95 theses that, that Luther kind of hammers onto the Wittenberg door. It was just meant to be for friends, to start a dialogue about, you know, the church has got quite a few things wrong, right? And he just goes on this 95-point rant, okay? It's, it's like if you kind of do a rant on Facebook. But then all of a sudden, it's, imagine that BuzzFeed just links to your Facebook post, and then suddenly, boom, it goes global. Because the printers got hold of his 95 Theses, and it went throughout all of Europe. And now suddenly this thing that was just meant to be a personal rant becomes this global concern as other people start getting invited into this liberating message that the Scriptures are teaching. Well, this puts him on a collision course with the Roman Catholic authorities, and the Pope actually... Uh, issues a papal bull that excommunicates Luther in 1520. Luther being Luther, when he received the papal bull, what did he do? He burnt it. Um, the bull is not an animal, by the way. The bull is a document. Never mind. Um, he didn't burn an animal. So, but when the Pope gives him this document that says, right, you're out of the church, he just burns it and he keeps on writing and he keeps on writing. He gets summoned to a council in Worms. And uh, perhaps you know about this, this famous moment when all the empire and all the church is against Luther. And they, they set out his 25 books that he'd written. He'd only written them in the last couple of years, 25 books. This is like he's really pumping stuff out. And they ask him, will you recant from these works? And he takes a day to think about it. And then he comes, out, comes back and he says this, unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason I do not accept the authority of the popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me. Amen. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I don't care what the prince says. I don't care what the emperor says. I don't care what the pope says. The Bible says this. And he takes his stand. He can do no other. Well, Luther is declared a heretic at this stage, and he probably would have been executed, except some friends kidnap him and smuggle him secretly to Wartburg Castle. And the very first thing Luther does, he's got plenty of time on his hands. What does he do in Wartburg Castle is he translates the Bible into German so that the common people can understand this gospel goodness in their own language. He wanted everybody to have this liberation that he had. And in the next 25 years, his output was absolutely phenomenal. You know, if you've got Luther's works on your shelf, there are 55 fat volumes of Bible commentaries and lectures and sermons. And at the end of his life, Luther looked back on the impact that he'd had on the world. And really, if you're compiling a top 10 of people who have changed the world, Luther is definitely, he's on everybody's top 10 list, right? How did he do it? How did he bring about such a transformation? He once said this, he said, I, I opposed all the papists, but never with force. I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And while I slept or drank Wittenberg beer with my friends, Philip and Amsdorf, he was big into his beer, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that no prince or emperor ever inflicted such losses upon it. I did nothing. The word did everything. It's the power of the Bible. Power of the Bible, as you open it up and you see the gospel of Christ given to you for free, that causes the reformation in your heart. It causes the reformation in history. So over the next few weeks, we'll be studying five statements that summarize the teaching of the reformation. So uh, this Sunday, we're thinking about scripture alone. Next Sunday, we'll think about Everything God's, God does is to God's glory alone. He gives salvation for free as a gift, and the giver gets the glory. Everything's done for God's glory alone. And then grace alone, it is a sheer gift of mercy, not because you've earned it, but because God is gracious. It's received by faith alone. You don't root around in your pocket trying to say, oh, how much do I owe you for that salvation? No, nothing. You, you can owe nothing. You can pay nothing. 
It is a gift that is received by faith alone. And then Christ alone. Christ is the one who does it all. He descends every single, every single stair of the Scala Sancta. He comes down into the gutter. He takes your sins unto himself. He takes them down to the hellish death that they deserve. He rises up again and he gives you God's righteousness for free and forever. It's all Christ. It's just Christ. It's Christ alone. And it's the Scriptures give us this beautiful truth. And so with the time remaining, I just want to spend some time thinking about these scriptures. And my prayer is that just as the scriptures birthed a reformation in my life, just as the scriptures birthed a reformation in the church, they'll birth a reformation and a re-reformation in your own heart. Let's think about the reformation that the scriptures can bring. Do you remember how Luther said that he was captive to the word of God? absolutely captive to the Word of God. We're going to think about how if we are captive to the Word of God, we are freed for the world. Captive to the Bible, liberated for the world. What do I mean by that? Well, let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, If you've got Bibles in your hands, or it should be up on the screen as well, 2 Timothy 3, the Apostle Paul is speaking. From infancy, you, Timothy, who he's writing to, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Let's ask three questions of this passage. First of all, what are the Scriptures? Well, according to this, the Scriptures are the very Word of God breathed out by the Spirit. Just as your breath carries your Word, so the Spirit has authored these Scriptures as God's own voice directly addressing you. Do you believe that about the Bible? That the Bible really is God's Word God's speech written. Is that how you see the Bible? People sometimes say to me, I'd just, I just, I just really like to hear God on this issue. I'd really like to hear from God. Would you like to really hear from God? And when people say to me, they, they just want to hear from God, I've got a question for them. How dusty is your Bible? Because when you open these scriptures, you have the very breathed out words of the living God addressed to you. They are living, they are active, they are powerful, they are transformative, they are life-giving. What is the Bible? The Bible is God's speech written, breathed out by the breath of the Spirit. He's whispering in your ear. He is. Do you want to hear what he's saying? Crack open that Bible. Get into the Word. Hear what it is that the Spirit is breathing out to you. What are the Scriptures? They are the very Word of God. Secondly, who are they given to? It's fascinating here. The assumption here that the the Scriptures are given to simpletons like you and me. Simpletons who need to be contradicted. It says, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training. Right? What does that assume? That assumes that you are foolish, wrong, wayward, and immature. Okay? It's kind of confronting, isn't it? The Bible, the Bible assumes that you're a simpleton who needs to be made wise for salvation. We all need to be taught and reproved. That means told off at times. Told off. We need to be told off. I remember watching uh, 2006, the, uh, the World Cup. And do you remember the one where Wayne Rooney gets uh, sent off in the quarterfinals and Cristiano Ronaldo kind of gives a wink to the, to, to the others on the bench because he basically got him sent off. But Rooney was an idiot. He was an absolute idiot stamped on somebody, got sent off, red card, you idiot, you loser. And I just remember what one of the commentators said. He said, I wish Wayne Rooney's mother had told him no once. Right? <laughs> I wish he'd been told no just once in his life. It would have been for his good. <laughs> that, I'm not saying that that is the correct commentary on that particular situation, but that, that's what he said. And the Bible says that we need to be told no because we're simpletons, because we're foolish, we're wrong, we're wayward, we're immature. And it's for our good 
that the Bible comes in and, and actually contradicts us, teaches us, reproves us, corrects us, trains us. But that's not all the Bible. The Bible is not just a bunch of, of no's. Fundamentally, the Bible is a 100% yes to Jesus. And that's the third point. Why are the Scriptures given? The Scriptures are given, according to verse 15, to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. You know what the Scriptures are ultimately? The Scriptures are not a rule book telling you no. The Scriptures are proclamation of good news. That though you are down in the gutter, Christ has come all the way for you. That you are loved, you are blessed, you are liberated, you are given life in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that about the Scriptures? That they are God's Word? Do you believe that about yourself? That you need to be corrected by these Scriptures? Do you believe this about the purpose of the Bible? They've been given to offer you Christ and to offer you Christ again and again and again. As you are captive to the word, you are freed in the world. As you are captive to this word, you are freed for the world. Because the Bible says countercultural things. And, and just as Luther had to look at the Bible on one hand and the emperor and the pope and everybody else on the other hand, and he had to say, not that this. We need to do that as well. The Bible's going to come and, and contradict us, and it's going to contradict our dearest intuitions about what life is really about. The Bible is very counterintuitive and countercultural like that. So the world, for instance, says, the world says, make yourself attractive, and then you'll be loved. That's kind of the philosophy. It's the, it's the scala sancta. It's the holy stairs of the world. Make yourself attracted, and then you'll be loved. And the Bible says the exact opposite. The Bible says you are loved, loved at your worst, and therefore you're attractive. It's utterly different. But when you press into the truth of the Bible that is so countercultural, so counterintuitive, you'll be set free in the world, I tell you. The world says get as many experiences as you can, and then you'll find yourself. Bring to yourself as many experiences as you possibly can, build your CV. Yeah, build your CV of travel and performances and experience, and, and then you'll find yourself. And the Bible says, no, lose yourself and you'll find yourself. Lose your life in sacrificial service, and then you'll find yourself. Totally different thing. But when you press into that, when you make yourself captive to this word, you become liberated for the world. Another example. The world says... Indulge your lusts, and that is sexual liberation. Indulge your lusts, and that is sexual liberation. The Bible says indulging lust is like indulging an addiction. It only enslaves you. Control yourself sexually. That is liberation. Which are we going to believe? The world or the Scriptures? Here's the possibility. Press into the Scriptures. Make yourself captive to this word, word, and you'll be freed for the world. You really will. The world says life is what you make it. The Bible says life is what Jesus has freely given you. The world says climb the ladder. The Bible says Christ has come down to us by grace alone to be received by faith alone. So be convinced by Scripture. Did you notice in, in Luther's quotes all the different ways that he spoke about Scripture? He spoke about be, becoming convinced by Scripture, being captive to the Word of God. He spoke about beating impatiently on Scripture. He spoke about giving heed to the context. He spoke about meditating on the Bible day and night. That is where freedom lies. It really is. It's where reformation happens. It's how you get born again and enter paradise through open gates. So how do you treat the Bible? You wake up in the morning, bleary-eyed, and maybe you've got a Bible on your bedside table or something, and you, through one eye, you stare at your Bible. Your Bible stares back. What is your Bible? Is it a sack of rocks that you've got to shoulder? I suppose I better read a chapter. Shoulder the 
rocks so that you can go through the day as an earnest religious person. Is that what the Bible is? The Bible's a pair of wings so that you can fly. How do you read the Bible? How do you read the Bible? Okay, let's, let's, let's imagine that you do crack open the Bible. You manage to do that. How do you read? Well, notice all the ways that, that Luther read the Bible. He, he spoke about giving heed to the context. He spoke about meditating on the Bible. He spoke about beating impatiently on verses you don't understand and returning to them, seeing them in context, meditating on them. Do you ever put these verses on your tongue and roll them around for a little bit? Is that how you read the Bible? I was reading uh, 1 Peter 4 this morning. And there were just five words that absolutely skewered me. You are sharing Christ's sufferings. Speaking to a suffering church, and Peter wanted to encourage them. And in 1 Peter 4 says, you are sharing Christ's sufferings. And that absolutely went through me. And so I started meditating on it. And I, and I started thinking about those five words. You are sharing in Christ's sufferings. 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 You're sharing in Christ's sufferings. It'd be so easy just to pass those five words, wouldn't it? And then they're gone. And you're in the shower and you're out the door. How do we read our scriptures? Do we beat impatiently on them? Do we give heed to the context? Do we meditate on them? Roll them around in the mouth and taste and see that the Lord is good? How do we read our Bible? And how do we we submit to it? Do we come to the Bible and do we say, Lord, actually, I am foolish, wrong, wayward, and immature? So please, teach, reprove, correct, and train me. Do we do that? Do we have that attitude of humility that the Scriptures are above us to contradict us, to tell us no, so that it can redirect us to Christ's great yes to us? Will we come to the Scriptures in that attitude, submitting to them, being captive to the Word? That will make you free for the world. That will make you a real free thinker. You know, we think about being a free thinker. Uh, the world might look on and see Christians as you know, slaves, Christians as those who are brainwashed. I happen to think we're free thinkers. Because I happen to think if you only think what this tiny blip of cultural zeitgeist thinks, if you are so inhabiting this cultural moment that you believe all the things that this cultural moment believes, that's the real slavery. That is the real slavery. You want to be freed from that? Anchor yourself to something eternal. Then you'll no longer be a slave. Be captive to the word and you'll be freed for the world. Let me finish with this. I was a medieval teenager, absolutely enslaved, trying to climb the holy stairs of being a righteous, religious do-gooder. And then one day... Having laid my faith to one side, a friend invited me to a Bible study, and I thought, well, why not? We went to this Bible study, and we were studying the Garden of Gethsemane. And I said to the Bible study leader, I'm not sure I can be here. The Garden of Gethsemane is too much. It's, it's, I, I can't do it like Jesus. And my friend leading the study said, what do you mean do it like Jesus? I said, well, I mean, there he is giving his life to God like this. I, I just couldn't do it like that. And my friend said, Glenn... Do you think you're Jesus? I said, no, obviously. Well, no, no, I don't think I'm Jesus. You know, in Hebrews chapter 5, press into the Scriptures, beat impatiently on them, see the context, meditate on them. When you understand Hebrews chapter 5, it says Christ made his loud cries and prayers, and he was heard because of his faithful submission. He has become a high priest for you. Oh, that's interesting. In the Bible, you know what Jesus is doing in the Garden of Gethsemane? He's not just saying, here's your example, copy me. 
He's saying, I am your high priest. I'm praying for you. Fool that you are. Simpleton that you are. Failure that you are. My friend in this Bible study, he said, Glenn, do you think you're Jesus? Said, well, no. He's, he said, Glenn, you are not Jesus in this story. In the story of the Garden of Gethsemane, who are you? You're Peter. And what's Peter doing in the Garden of Gethsemane? Sleeping. Foolish. Failure, Peter. And Jesus prays for him. And suddenly, I'm born again. And I enter paradise through open gates. It's about Christ descending into the pit to be with and to be for idiots like you and me. And it's pressing into the scriptures that open my eyes to that truth. That's the reformation that the Bible always brings. That when we submit to Scripture alone, we see that salvation is a gift for God's glory alone, given in Christ alone, by grace alone, received by faith alone, and it's liberation. It really is. That's the reformation the Bible always brings. It happened in history. May it happen, and may it continue to happen in our hearts. Amen.